often in discussions baseless claims are made. Regrettably, those discussions end nowhere if either side is unwilling to consider the facts and their source. A chance to win over the onlooker is lost when this happens. This does not mean that we do not need to substantiate our claims. We need evidence from reputable sources which can be verified independently. It is my mission to help you understand what climate change is, how we cause it, and what we need to do to leave this planet a better place than we found it. I've been running the numbers for five years now, and have learned a great deal I wouldn't have if I didn't check the figures in news articles and try to understand them better. In checking some of these figures, you discover new insights that might help you change your mind on several issues. Today I want to show you how to build a reasonable view on the effects on energy we might expect from population growth. To do this I am going to download some Excel files which have been made available by both the OECD and the US Energy Information Administration websites. One of the pervasive arguments for a clean energy future is to begin with energy efficiency. Energy efficiency is a very broad concept that can be applied to many things involving energy. Think about buying more efficient consumer goods, use more local products, build better houses, etc. However, is this enough? To start investigating this question, I first need a set of assumptions which help me make a couple of models that I can use to determine the answer. Here are some of my key assumptions. First, the OECD energy per capita decreases by 30% as an effect of increased energy efficiency. Second, for non-OECD, four models are proposed, status quo and a 10, 20 and 30% increase in energy per capita demand. Third, we are going to slow down population growth by 200 of a percent each year until the growth rate reaches 0%. Let's start with the data. I start by looking for population data, which I find on the OECD website. It shows us data from the 2000 to 2013 timeframe. Now, the nice thing about this website is that it lets you export the data. So let's export the data to an Excel file. So right now I've got all the data I need to start working on my models. Subsequently, I want to attach data about primary energy demand. So I visit the Energy Information Administration website and navigate to the first chapter of the International Energy Outlook 2016 report. Now I could use the figures attached to the first figure, however, if I scroll down, you can see that the second figure has far more fidelity, which means that there is more data behind it. Now below this figure you can see an Excel button with figure data next to it. Let's download the data. So now I'm set to start modeling in order to find the answers to my questions. Now we have the file that shows energy consumption, historical data and a projection. These figures are in quads or quadrillion BTU, which is a metric we use to designate energy. Here you can see that the Energy Information Administration expects energy consumption to grow from 588 quads in 2016 up to 840 quads in 2040. As for the population data, I am only going to differentiate between OECD and non-OECD countries. So I am going to cut the rest, which is superfluous to me. We put all this data in a new sheet and start performing some actions. First, we determine that the average growth rate is 1.20% over the entire world and that the OECD growth rate is 0.76%. Non-OECD growth rate is 1.31%. Based on these rates, we extrapolate how many people there would be 
in 2040, we would arrive at 9.8 billion people. It is probable that the growth rate will decline over time. But I want to show you when you account for a progressively stagnating growth rate up until 2040, you still have a tremendous problem in terms of energy consumption. I assume an annual decrease in growth rate of two hundredths of a percent, which would mean that the OECD growth rate would stall around 2040. This assumption in growth decline is overly optimistic in both OECD and non-OECD growth models. I do this to determine whether the argument for energy efficiency really holds water. With the decline in growth model, we would have 9.3 billion people on the earth by 2040, which is a difference of 614 million people, equal to 6.21% with the 1.20 growth rate. With the growth models in place, we can now calculate the effect of energy efficiency in the OECD coupled with energy consumption growth in the non-OECD. I am going to try to level out the playing field, assuming that in order to eradicate poverty and hardship, we will have to raise non-OECD per capita energy consumption by at least 10%, but preferably 30% as that would level out energy consumption per capita across the world. These assumptions have far-stretching moral implications as we know that increasing fossil fuel consumption increases the incidence of respiratory diseases and subsequent deaths, and also increases the threat of anthropogenic climate change, leading to increased desertification, crop failure and other harmful effects. Possible positive effects from increased energy prosperity in non-OECD countries are increased freshwater availability, improved sanitation practices, no more indoor cooking with detrimental fuels such as dried animal feces or wood, increased food security, increased access to education, Increased access to medical care. We built four models. A status quo in which energy per capita remains the same in OECD and non-OECD countries. A 30% decrease of energy per capita for OECD countries. And a 10, 20 or 30% increase of energy per capita for non-OECD countries. As a reference, I have included the energy models of the Energy Information Administration, the Solutions Project, Greenpeace and the World Wildlife Fund. The first thing we may note is that on a larger scale, it doesn't really matter whether there is a 10, 20 or 30% increase in energy prosperity in non-OECD countries. This margin is about 7% or 25,000 terawatt hours, which is as much as all the electricity we produce right now. But do note that total energy consumption will be 350,000 terawatt hours. Secondly, the margin between the status quo model and the Energy Information Administration is about 30,000 terawatt hours. The Energy Information Administration is more optimistic. A very large discrepancy can be seen between my models, the model of the Energy Information Administration, and the models provided by the Solutions Project, Greenpeace, and the World Wildlife Fund. It is impossible to raise non OECD energy prosperity to any meaningful height with these proposals and I question the morality thereof. In this last graph, I want to show you how large the difference between the OECD and non-OECD total consumption already is, and how the other models fail to come even close to providing enough energy. The first thing we may note is that the status quo and the EIA prediction are almost the same in terms of OECD energy consumption. 
The EIA underlines this by stating in their 2016 energy outlook, and I quote, much of the world increase in energy demand occurs among the developing non-OECD nations outside the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, where strong economic growth and expanding populations lead the increase in world energy use. Non-OECD demand for energy rises by 71% from 2012 to 2040. In contrast, in the more mature energy-consuming and slower-growing OECD economies, total energy use rises by only 18% from 2012 to 2040. Now, growth will come from non-OECD countries. OECD countries may find an efficiency gain, perhaps even as much as 30%. But I think that I have reliably shown you that this is an unlikely scenario and will be nullified entirely by the thirst for energy of a growing population in non-OECD countries. Do note that the thirst for energy encompasses much more than just electricity or transportation. It is much more vast than that. It involves everything from clean water food, building materials, services, and so on. Okay, It all boils down to this. Energy efficiency can alleviate some of the stress we put on our energy resources. However, this short exercise shows us that scenarios that depend on the assumption that a growing world population can do with less thanks to energy efficiency needs to be considered from a more nuanced position. Energy efficiency in OECD countries is required. People in non-OECD countries need more energy at higher energy efficiencies. Since many people in non-OECD countries live in a situation of energy poverty and subsistence, we cannot justify assuming a status quo or a mild energy per capita increase. We need to lift these people out of poverty and into energy prosperity, and it will take a tremendous amount of energy generators to get there. In fact, we need to start producing them on an unprecedented scale. Consider, for instance, nuclear reactors, one of the most efficient energy sources on the planet. We've managed to start dozens of these in the 1970s, However, the complexity around nuclear energy keeps us from building a significant number in OECD countries. So keeping that what we have is already incredibly important. There are a couple of groups working on this issue. Think about Mothers for Nuclear, Environmental Progress and Generation Atomic. If we lose this generation capacity, the gap we need to bridge will become much larger sooner than we can afford. So the groups I just mentioned would really benefit from your help. Think about the 60s invention by Alvin Weinberg and Eugene Wigner. The molten salt reactor, which can be manufactured on an assembly line. We could build hundreds of these a year rather than dozens. Commercialization of these reactors is less than a decade away. And in fact, Practical tests are already being performed all over the world and China has a couple of hundred people working on becoming the first to build an MSR. The reason why I advocate the molten salt reactor is precisely because it can do much more than just deliver electricity. It can also be used to offset fossil fuels in industrial processes which require thermal energy. It can also be used to desalinate water using waste heat after electricity has been produced. It can be used as a chemical platform to create valuable isotopes for industry and medicine. As it offers us this kind of versatility, it is paramount that we start upping our game to incorporate these in our future energy portfolio. Also note that renewables such as geothermal, Hydro, wind and solar have to pitch in as well to bridge a sizable gap.
Also, the material's footprint for wind and solar prevent us from going all in renewable. But that doesn't mean that we don't need them, and in higher numbers than we see today. Bridging the gap without nuclear or wind or solar is going to worsen the problems from climate change and the combustion economy. And that should always be our prime consideration. How do we eliminate the combustion economy as quickly as possible should be the question, as opposed to how do we become 100% renewable or how do we implement energy efficiency? The first one cannot be achieved, and the second one is necessary, but its effects are grossly overestimated. I hope that this video has shown you how to make a reasonable and well-informed decision when it comes to addressing these issues. I want to take this moment to thank my subscribers and my patrons in particular. I feel incredibly fortunate to have your support. Without your help, I couldn't have gotten this far. I promise you that this is only the beginning. Your contributions have made it possible to travel to England in three weeks and give my first presentation at the Reason and Science coffee shop in Watford, where one of my patrons is the patron. A big shout out to you, Neil Amory. If you like this video, please click the thumbs up button. You can subscribe to this channel to get notified when I upload another video. And please visit my Patreon channel if you want to help me take care of my family while making more content for you to share and spread the message of nuclear humanism. Thank you for watching.